Hello, my name is Katie Gold, and I'm an assistant professor of grape pathology at Cornell University. Today, I will be presenting on airborne and spaceborne imaging spectroscopy for early grapevine viral disease detection. I run the Grape Sensing Pathology and Extension Lab at Cornell Agritech. We specialize in the use of a diverse range of sensing modalities across scales, from handheld to laboratory to proximal robotics, as well as drones. But in particular, we specialize in the use of airborne and eventually spaceborne imaging spectroscopy for early grape disease detection. I serve as, the, as NASA Acres Pest and Disease Risk Mitigation Lead, in this capacity, I help expand and um, educate upon the use of remote sensing, particularly spaceborne remote sensing, for pest and disease risk mitigation. Today, I've been asked to talk about prospects for early detection of grapevine viral diseases with hyperspectral imaging, which is a colloquial term for imaging spectroscopy. Due to my expertise, I will be focusing on airborne and spaceborne imaging spectroscopy today. Throughout this talk, I'll be addressing these questions and have them highlighted on the slides as we address them. First, I'd like to discuss what the current state of research on hyperspectral imaging for detecting plant disease, including grapevine viruses such as leaf roll and red blotch. As I mentioned, hyperspectral imaging is a colloquial term for imaging spectroscopy, which is the science of how light interacts with our world. When we consider vegetative imaging spectroscopy, this is the sort of technology we are referring to when we colloquially say hyperspectral imaging. Imaging spectroscopy is a powerful technology because it's able to measure light near continuously. This is what makes a sensor a hyperspectral sensor, in contrast to a multispectral sensor which measures light in discrete intervals. The range of light that I'll be talking about today spans the visible to the shortwave infrared, and some acronyms that I'll reference throughout this talk include VIS, which is short for the visible range of light from about 450 to 750, the NEAR, which is short for the near infrared range of light, which ranges from 800 to 1200 nanometers, and SWEAR for the shortwave infrared region of light. When we reference the something called full spectrum imaging spectroscopy, we're talking about sensors that can measure from the visible range through the shortwave infrared up to about 2400 nanometers. These sorts of sensors are incredibly powerful for vegetative spectroscopy and therefore disease detection because they are capable of measuring plant chemistry. This is because innate plant chemistry as well as physiology changes light reflectance. If we consider hyperspectral um, reflectance across the range, there are known spectral regions that correspond to plant constituents. Traits that range from carbohydrates, nitrogen, leaf mass per area, sugars and starches, etc as well as compounds related to defense and decomposition. Through the use of either statistical inference, such as partial least squares regression analysis, or radiative transfer modeling, we can turn hyperspectral reflectance into highly accurate quantifications of plant chemistry. The changes that are imparted by plant disease, including that caused by grapevine viruses, impact how solar radiation interacts with leaves, canopy, and general plant constitution. If we consider the leaf, solar light will do one of three things when it interacts with the plant. It will be reflected back, it will be transmitted through, or it will be absorbed for photosynthesis. The majority of light is actually reflected back after being both internally dispersed as well as surface dispersed. We know that plant pathogens physically and chemically change plant constitution, which changes that reflected light. That reflected light can be measured by a sensor as distantly placed as a satellite in space. Now, if we consider this known link between biochemical and physiological plant constituents and how they affect spectral reflectance, and the power of combining this with imagers, we al this allows us to study plant disease at scale. The important takeaway here is that in aggregate, this yields spectral responses that are readily capturable in vSphere imagery both before and after visible symptoms appear of disease. This is now a well-established fact. Additionally, recent work has established that multiple economically important diseases, such as those caused by bacteria, fungal, omycete, and viral diseases, including grapevine leaf roll virus, can be both asymptomatically and symptomatically detected using full spectrum hyperspectral imagery collected via aircraft mounted imaging spectrometers.
What specific spectral signatures or patterns are indicative of grapevine viruses and how reliable are they for accurate diagnosis? The idea of universally applicable and scalable from the foliar to canopy scale spectral signatures of disease does not exist. We, while we can develop models for physiological traits such as nitrogen or sugars perhaps, and we can find those to be scalable, disease is a dynamic and chaotic process that results in variable changes to plant physiology between the foliar to canopy scale. An example here is a case study of sudden, sudden death syndrome in soybean by Herman et al. published in Remote Sensing. This study found that the most important wavelengths for detection and classification can vary significantly between leaf and canopy measurements. Canopy models were mainly dependent on biomass characteristics, whereas leaf models were mainly dependent on pigments and water. This is because the way disease manifests and the impact of disease varies between the foliar and the canopy scale, as well as how important those changes to spectral biology are differ between the foliar and canopy scale. Remember that changes to physiology drive early disease detection, and while these can vary significantly between foliar and canopy measurements, they also vary across varieties and crop health status. So it is not possible to take a foliar measurement and use that to inform canopy level detection. It's important when searching for uh, disease detection models and developing disease surveillance to study innately at the canopy scale. Working first at the foliar scale can help us understand what physiological processes might be contributing to the underlying spectral biology that we're sensing, but it is very important for us to study and develop models at the canopy scale for widespread use. Are there any specific camera instruments or vendors that you would recommend? The best quality imagery available comes from space agencies. For example, NASA's Avarice Family Suite, which includes Avarice Classic, Next Generation, and Three, as well as the Spaceborne Imaging Spectrometer, EMIT, provide the highest quality spectroscopic imagery available. The best-in-class commercial UAV-mounted imaging spectrometer is the HiSpecs VS620, which can also be mounted on aircraft. This is the highest quality imaging spectrometer available on the commercial market. Even so, it does still have high noise in key spectral regions and some discontinuities. In contrast to NASA emits spaceborne imaging spectrometer, which is smooth in key regions across the scale, and there's no discontinuity outside of emitting wavelengths that are um, so that we call the water bands because they react too strongly to atmospheric water. So the best quality imaging spectroscopy data available for disease detection comes from space agencies. Are there any ongoing research projects or future directions in this field that you find particularly promising or exciting? In particular, I find the use of the Avarice family suite of sensors very exciting for the prospects for early grapevine disease detection. This is because the Avarice family suite will form the foundation of the forthcoming hyperspectral satellite, surface biology and geology that will be launched by NASA at the late 20, in the late 2020s, early 2030. In particular, my lab has focused on using Avarice next generation for asymptomatic leaf roll virus detection in California. In 2020, we conducted what our pilots nicknamed the Wine Tour, which was an air and ground campaign with Avaris NG that was funded by the NASA Biodiversity Office. In total, we captured 37,000 acres of grapevine and partnered very closely with on the ground scouts who sent teams out to sweep vine by vine 300 acres to flag and geotag GL symptomatic GLRV infected vines in both September 2020 and September 2021. A subset of these vines were sent for commercial testing with ELISA and PCR to validate their diagnostics, and the scouts were found to be 100% accurate. This is a really unique and exciting data set because of the double because the collections were taken in both 2020 and 2021. This enabled us to have two classes to our data set. Any grapevines that were visibly symptomatic in 2020, we were able to label symptomatic. Vines that were non-symptomatic in 2020, but became visibly symptomatic in 2021, 
we were able to assume must have been latently infected in 2020 at the time of the flight and therefore are labeled asymptomatic. This is consistent with what is known about grapevine biology. However, it is important to acknowledge that this is an indeed an assumption that we made as it was not possible for us to molecularly test every grapevine across the 300 acres, as our intention here was to assess landscape scale scalability and not individual vine-based detection. How early in the infection process can hyperspectral imaging detect viral infections in grapevine, and is it effective for detecting asymptomatic infections? Our investigation found that yes, airborne imaging spectroscopy is indeed effective for detecting asymptomatic infections based on this data set that we gathered and the assumptions that we made about latent infections and symptomatic infections. We found that we were able to differentiate the combination of symptomatic and asymptomatic vines from non-infected with about 85% accuracy when we integrated three different pre-processing techniques prior to conducting random forest. We first did synthetic minority oversampling technique to increase the number of symptomatic, uh, sorry, in virus infected vines in our study. We smoothed out the data set and we used a technique called spectral unmixing to delete out any soil and otherwise non-vegetative influence from our spectra. So to answer the question, how early in the infection process can hyperspectral imaging detect viral infections? Well, from this work, we can uh, say that we can definitely, well, we most likely detect asymptomatic infections. However, we cannot yet pinpoint exactly when in the infection process a vine becomes detectable with airborne imaging spectroscopy. Foliar work has found that there are spectral differences that occur quite earlier in the symptomatic, uh, sorry, that occur quite early in the infection process that allow for asymptomatic detection, but it is yet unknown how early we can detect asymptomatic infection at the airborne scale. Are challenges different for asymptomatic and symptomatic plants? The answer to this question is both yes and no. This plot on the left is a spectral residual plot. This is a way of normalizing spectral reflectance to understand which regions are most indicative of changes across the classes in our study. Overall, we see that there's quite a bit of spectral commonality in the visible range across our non-infected symptomatic and asymptomatic data sets, and that we see divergence across the near infrared as well as in the shortwave infrared. These are regions that are known to be most strongly associated with plant physiology. So this might influence, um, indicate to us that the underlying physiological processes that are informing our ability to do this detection may be differing across these classes. However, when we look at the confusion matrices for non-infected symptomatic and asymptomatic classification, we see that our models are quite frequently, when they make errors, they are confusing symptomatic and asymptomatic vines. This implies that there's some sort of commonality between asymptomatic and symptomatic vines that is sufficient for our models to get confused about whether which class is which, so that there's more commonality between asymptomatic and symptomatic vines than there is between asymptomatic and non-infected vines and symptomatic and non-infected vines, respectively. Is ground truthing data a challenge and do we expect that co-infection complicates this? Yes, absolutely. Ground truthing is always the biggest challenge. The lack of extensive high quality ground validation prevents us from addressing the biological confounding that would enable us to reduce misclassifications as well as to better understand the fundamentals of spectral biology within the grapevine viral system. For example, in our work, our phytopathology paper in 2023, we were not able to delete out the impact of co-occurring heat wave and water stress. Vines were variably undergoing drought stress at the time of the flight and were exposed to um, high temperatures. Additionally, we see edge effects of vines experiencing um, unknown stressors. Additionally, we are not able to account for co-occurring diseases, which we also see in some alternate work has a really big impact on model, accurate model development. 
in a case study of grapevine powdery mildew and grapevine downy mildew detection, we find that the higher the grapevine powdery mildew incidence is, the more difficult it is to accurately detect grapevine downy mildew. But in order to address this, we need significant amounts of data at scale, which is a real challenge given the labor and time requirements for using highly accurate molecular tools. Because of this, we have torn, turned towards using robotics in order to map symptomatic vines at scale to generate the amount of data that we need to make landscape scale inf inferences. Our robot is called the Phytopatholobot and was developed by the Jiang Lab at Cornell Agritech. It autonomously navigates through the vineyard and is it has models that has been developed for both grapevine downy mildew detection as well as grapevine leaf roll virus. In addition to its autonomous navigation, it is able to see disease in its imagery for both downy mildew and grapevine leaf roll virus with the same level of accuracy as a human being looking at that same imagery. And it automatically generates a severity map of the area scouted. We brought the phytopatholobot out to a vineyard in Southern California in 2022 to train it on GLRV infected vines. And we found that it has a very high accuracy rate for detecting symptomatic vines. Now, one of the challenges with this system is that it is not capable of detecting asymptomatic vines. Right now, the only technology that we have for ground validation of asymptomatic vines is using time to our advantage as we did with the phytopathology study, relying on our understanding of disease biology and that latent period, making the assumption that any vine that was not symptomatic last year gets harvested and just destructively harvested and then appears to be symptomatic the next year must have been latently infected at the time of study or using molecular tools such as ELISA and PCR, which can be quite expensive and um, time consuming. What are the major roadblocks in applying hyperspectral imaging to virus detection with airborne and spaceborne imaging spectroscopy? Given the focus of this talk is that is at that airborne and spaceborne scale, one of the biggest challenges we face is that the native spectral resolution of these high quality imaging spectroscopy data products from the space agencies are not suited to individual vine disease detection or not necessarily suited. The average family suite based on an aircraft has a variable pixel size ranging from one to 20 meters, depending on how high the aircraft has flown. EMIT has a 60 meter resolution and forthcoming surface biology and geology will have a 30 meter pixel resolution. This means that in order to use these data sets at scale for disease detection, we need to adopt a number of approaches to help give our data the best chance possible, including spectral unmixing, which effectively uses matrixing masks to untangle a spectra like you would uh, a thread of yarn into its component parts, adopting a data model future fusion approach by merging this high spectral resolution but low spatial resolution imagery with high spatial resolution imagery collected from a different platform, as well as integrating our decision-making in an algorithmic fashion with epidemiological modeling so that we're not simply relying on spectral imagery alone for decision-making. These will help mitigate the challenge that the spatial resolution poses for using this technology for widespread grapevine viral disease detection. Another major roadblock is that airborne and spaceborne spectroscopy generates a huge amount of data and it also requires expert analysis and interpretation, which significantly challenges stakeholder use. Scalable distributed computing systems can help address this challenge. We developed a system called WineGuard that uses a distributed computing platform that enables a stakeholder to use, to take advantage of spectroscopic imagery from space agencies for on-farm disease detection by having a distributed setup that allows for both in-farm um, computing on-site at the farm, as well as in the cloud, it allows our stakeholders to use this data for disease detection while maintaining grower privacy. They do not have to have any potentially important um, and uh, privacy protected data shared into the cloud, which might prevent usage. And we found that the accuracy of these models are quite high. 
So to sum up what's discussed in this talk here, I've answered, I've sought to answer the questions posed with this lens of airborne and spaceborne imaging spectroscopy. And I'm summing up my, my the overall takeaways here. So if you've zoned out for most of this talk, it's time to tune back in. What is the current state of research? Imaging spectroscopy can detect both asymptomatic and symptomatic grapevine viral infestation from airborne platforms across the one to five meter resolution scale. This bodes well for the use of future spaceborne imaging spectroscopy products as airborne spectroscopy is the closest step to spaceborne level. What are the major roadblocks? The first major roadblock is the large pixel size. This can be amended with adopt by adopting spectral unmixing techniques, data fusion, as well as integrating with modeling. The lack of high quality ground truth data can be addressed through the adoption of robotic data acquisition systems. And finally, data inaccessibility prevents stakeholder usage. By developing open source distributed computing platforms, we can help make this data more accessible to stakeholders so that they can take advantage of this research for disease detection on their farms. How early in the infection process? This is yet unclear, but we find that it is indeed possible to do airborne disease detection during the asymptomatic phase. What specific spectral signatures or patterns are indicative of grapevine viruses and how reliable are they for accurate diagnosis? There is no such thing as universally applicable, scalable spectral signatures, signatures of disease. This is because physiological processes influence spectral biology that, and this is the underlying reason why we can use these sensors for detection in the first place. And these traits differ between the foliar and canopy scales. A model developed for the foliar scale cannot be translated to the canopy scale. Are the challenges different for asymptomatic and symptomatic plants? At the airborne scale, we have reason to believe that there is at least some commonality and consistency to the most important underlying physiological processes that are driving symptomatic and asymptomatic detection based on our observations of spectral biology and insights into our data. But it's important to assess that this is yet unclear and requires further study. Do we expect that co-infection complicates this? Yes. Judging from our work in other systems, Biological confounders will play a role in reducing accuracy unless we're able to acquire data at a sufficient scale to address this. What do I prefer as a ground truthing method? And is it a challenge? Generating sufficient training data at scale, at the scale required for meaningful landscape scale analyses is a huge barrier to implementation. Robotics can help improve the throughput of symptomatic plant mapping but we yet lack a high throughput and high accuracy way to generate asymptomatic um, maps. Are there any specific camera instruments and vendors that I recommend? Space agency instruments such as the Avers Family Suite and Emit are the gold standard and provide the highest quality imagery available. On the commercial market, the high specs VS620 is the best commercially available system. However, it has high noise and key spectral regions, and it is yet unknown if this will impact disease detection. Are there any ongoing research projects or future directions in this field you find particularly promising or exciting? I hope you'll agree with me that the research presented today is both promising and exciting. With that, I'm grateful to the committee for allowing me the op opportunity to present my work here today and look forward to the live question and answer session.